Hello, everyone. We're going to get started now. If I uh, can have your kind attention, please. Thank you very much. Okay, don't throw anything at me. Uh, <laughs> And it's, it's always a, a, a treat uh, to be part of this event, not only as a journalist, but as a news consumer, especially as a news consumer. Each year, I have been amazed at the diversity of information represented in the submissions, the stories, and issues that you've covered that often receive little or no attention from larger media organizations. Now, beyond presenting more important information about our many communities here in the New York City area, uh, there is a passion by all of you for truth and for accuracy. And as anyone knows who watches newscasts or reads newspapers or listens to podcasts these days in America, sadly, those values are being threatened by Americans who say that reporters are evil. Some of those Americans say news organizations specialize in fake news. In fact, there's one American in particular who says those things, and he will go, as they said in uh, Harry Potter, unnamed. All of that, of course, is a lie. Worse, the repetition of those lies, unfortunately, undermines the very important role of journalism in our democracy. And just wanted to take this moment of uh, personal privilege to applaud all of you who do your jobs with integrity and purpose and always in pursuit of truth. Now tonight, our, well, thank you. Uh, tonight, our keynote speaker is the wonderful, talented, brilliant, and handsome Errol Lewis. He is, uh, he, he paid me to say that. Uh, <laughs> He is the political anchor for New York One News and the host of Inside City Hall. He has interviewed countless local and national political figures. He's moderated dozens of debates between political candidates. And he is, as you know if you've seen and heard him, an exceptionally keen political commentator. What you may not know is that Mr. Lewis got his start in community journalism and has much to say about the role that all of you play in this city of ours. Now, before we bring Errol to this podium, uh, I would like to introduce a person we all know and love, Sarah Bartlett, the dean of this great journalism school, which, as of just last week, we learned, thanks to a remarkably generous $20 million donation, will henceforth be known as the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. Dean Bartlett. Thank you, everyone, and welcome to the 16th Annual Ippies. We're here tonight to celebrate the excellent work that's been done in the last year by the community and ethnic media in the New York region. It's hard to think of a time when that work is more important, and I'm excited to see those stories and you, the people who produce them, getting justly reserved, deserved recognition. I also want to thank our sponsors for this evening, without whom we couldn't put on this uh, event. Con Edison, 32BJ, SEIU, FJC, Metro Plus, Health Plan, the Moshalu Preservation Corporation, the David and Catherine Moore Family Foundation, and the New York State Nurses Association. I also want to take this moment to recognize the extraordinary team who support you every day at the Center for Community and Ethnic Media. Thanks to the leadership of Karen Penner and Jahangir Khatek. and the help they get from the incredibly capable Jennifer Chang, wherever you are. The work of the center has never been stronger or more important. Voices of New York is a must read for anyone concerned about immigrant communities in our region. 
The training that CCM offers in reporting, writing, business, and digital skills, supported by the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, as well as other funders, has become an invaluable resource. The interviews with public officials that they organize as part of our Newsmaker series in conjunction with Errol Lewis generate timely news stories and deepen the connections between public officials and the communities that are often under, overlooked. We're grateful to the Revson Foundation for its continued support of that work. Given this difficult moment in our nation's history, we believe it is time to share what we have learned and accomplished at CCEM with other regions of the country. I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of our hopes and dreams for CCM in the future. As many of you know, late last year, New America Media, which has been doing similar work nationally for many years from its base in California, closed its doors. At a time like this, when immigrant communities are so threatened and the political climate has become so toxic, it feels more essential than ever for that work to continue. Though we're not trying to replicate NAM, we are in the process of applying for grants to expand our range of offerings to help fill this gap. Broadening CCEM's reach and focus on the national horizon is going to require us to expand our team. Thanks to support from the Democracy Fund, we've just hired a new West Coast Executive Director, Daniela Gerson, who will be based in Los Angeles. Unfortunately, she just had twin babies and she's not able to be here with us tonight. But let me tell you a little bit about her. Daniela is an assistant professor of journalism at Cal State University Northridge, which is also known as CSUN. The school's journalism department has strong ties to ethnic media, features the country's first Spanish language journalism minor, publishes the bilingual El Nuevo, El Nuevo Sol, and various faculty members do research on the topic. It sounds like CSUN is the CUNY of California. So we're excited to see how Daniela's based there can strengthen CCEM's new direction. She speaks five languages and has extensive reporting experience on immigrant communities. When she was at USC before going to CSUN, she helped create a trilingual local news outlet, the Alhambra Source. And in January of last year, after the first travel ban went into effect, she launched with another founder a newsletter called Migratory Notes that I would encourage all of you to look at. Given the new national focus that we believe CCEM needs to have and the additional volume of administrative, strategic, and fundraising work that this will create, we will be seeking to hire a new executive director here in New York. The vital roles that Karen, Jahangir, and Jennifer have played in strengthening and showcasing your journalism, running training sessions, and serving as a bridge with the rest of the city will continue. Because we are still in the process of applying for grants and therefore don't know the exact contours of our funding, it is impossible to give you more concrete details at this time. But we wanted you to be aware of the new direction at CCEM that we're seeking to take and to assure you that we are committed to continuing our work with you. As our path becomes clearer, we will share more details with you. And in the meantime, please join me in giving a loud and heartfelt round of applause to Jennifer, Karen, and Jennifer, whose hard work and dedication to CCEM's mission go above and beyond every single day. And now on to the main event. It is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Errol Lewis. Uh, I first got to know Errol, I don't know, five or six years ago and recruited him to come and teach at the school. And when I was named the dean, I was uh, very pleased that he agreed to become the new director of the Urban Reporting Concentration, which I've been uh, so deeply involved with and passionate about. It's, it's hard to um, really describe him adequately. He's so passionate about teaching. You know, he's amazingly plugged into the city. He, know, he seems to know everyone. And uh, if you watch his show at night, as I often get a chance to do, I, I learn something every time I watch it. He's like a, a private civics instructor for our, country, for our city. So um, I, I'm just delighted that he's here with us tonight. I don't think the man sleeps, I, at least if he does. I haven't figured out when. But please welcome Errol Lewis to the stage.
Thank you so much, Sarah. And uh, I do have a few thank yous uh, to make, and then I'll talk to you for a few minutes, and then we can get to the main business of the night, which is rewarding all of the great work that has been done over the last year. Um, I uh, got out of college in the mid-'80s, came to New York, uh, had turned down a job at the Wall Street Journal to go work at a startup community newspaper called The City Sun which probably less than, fewer than half a dozen of you remember. Yeah, you remember that, right? For 150 bucks a week, and um, was glad to have it, and figured I could just get, uh, all I needed was a car and a press pass, and you know, would light the world on fire. It didn't work out exactly that way, but it was one of the best jobs I ever had. And one of the things I did uh, along the way was watch a lot of television news. And um, those of you who were watching along with me at that time saw the great Randall Pinkston, who was holding it down for WCBS News. And we were not at all surprised when he became a White House correspondent for CBS News. And it is an honor and a pleasure to share the podium with him and to also uh, meet him for the first time in person tonight. He said, you don't know me. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I got to say to him what everybody says to me, which is, I saw you in my living room night after night after night, and I do know you. <laughs> um, I also want to um, thank Karen and Jahangir for um, all of the work that they have done. You may have noticed that while the school is only 10 and a half or 11 years old, the Ippies Awards are far older, uh, and it's an important institution that they have reinvigorated, reconceived, reinvented, and it's always a pleasure to work with them. And I want to thank you for all of the work that you've done with me. <laughs> Last but not least, I do have to thank Sarah. Um, she has made some of the best and most consequential decisions in this institution's history. Uh, if she's on a hot streak, she, I mean, she really is. Everything she's touching is turning to gold. We all know about the recent $20 million endowment that Sarah secured from Craig Newmark, the founder of Craigslist. But she also has made a lot of only slightly less important decisions. One of those was the decision to call me in 2010, eight years, not five or six. And uh, Cole called me, asked if I wanted to help teach the urban reporting class. I was like, yeah, sure, I guess. Uh, and we, we co-taught it. And it has led to um, a longer relationship um, her, uh, along the way, I watched how she makes moves, and she makes big moves. She really does. Uh, she made the decision to offer this school as a home, institutional home for the Center for Community and Ethnic Media. She made the decision to uh, find a place for top-notch investigative reporters like Tom Robbins, who has been a, a real asset to all of us. She made the decision to start things, new things, uh, including securing an entire floor of this building that few of you have ever seen, the 14th floor of this building, sort of sight unseen. But she's also been building new programs, like uh, the Spanish language masters in journalism, first of its kind, a master's degree in social journalism, first of its kind. So she's on a hot streak. If you need to bet on anything, whatever Sarah wants to do, um, I'd, I'd go with it. Let me, let me say just a few words about the state of the news business. And I want to make the case to you that it's not as bad as you might think, or at a minimum, that we are well positioned to deal with the challenges that lie ahead. The uh, problems placing, uh, plaguing the news business, it's not an across the board phenomenon. There is some types of serious news gathering that are doing just fine. You could almost say that news is turning into a tale of two industries. At the national level, things are going very, very well, but local news is really taking a hit. One of my secondary employers, CNN, made over a billion dollars in profit last year. And believe me, I asked them for every bit of it. They said no. Um, they're poised to do the same again this year. But it is an entirely different story at another one of my side uh, employers, the New York Daily News, where I write a column. The news was recently sold, as you may have heard, for a dollar to a Chicago-based operation and is still cutting expenses every way it can. I was just informed that, hey, your column's not going to be 750 words. It's got to be 600. Why? Automated layout being done out of Chicago. Never even heard of such a thing. 
So the problem of local news, um, the problem that matters, I think, the most for those of us who are here is uh, a decline in regular beat reporting. The New York boroughs of Brooklyn and Queens combined have about five million people, which is slightly more than the population of Ireland. Um, but Ireland, which has 4.7 million residents, has eight daily newspapers and dozens of regional and local papers. The same is true of New Zealand, roughly the same size, about, about five million people. They have over a dozen newspapers. Costa Rica, same population, at least four dailies in Spanish, several in English, and at least two fully staffed online news sites. And again, um, you know, you look at Denmark, same size, three dozen newspapers. So things are different here, and we have fallen on hard times. There's no New York media organization with a regular presence in any court in the Bronx or in Queens. The Daily News, my beloved Daily News, is down to only two City Hall reporters. The New York Post and the New York Times each have only three at City Hall. It's a skeleton crew, and they are expected to cover the vast, sprawling apparatus of city government, including agencies that manage 86,000 public housing apartments, educate over a million school children, and collect 10,000 tons of garbage every day. Now, for some of this, for, for some of you, for most of you, in fact, this is like preaching to the choir, right? Where you're saying, hey, cry me a river. I, I'm, I'm making do with one reporter, or two reporters for a borough or half the, half the community. But with so few resources, what happens is we're barely meeting minimum standards of coverage, and it leaves government officials and unscrupulous politicians with an open playing field that they do not deserve. Now, this is actually a national problem. Over the last 20 years, the newspaper workforce has fallen about 40%. Newspaper circulation down about 30% over the same period. Between 2004 and 2014, the number of daily papers in the U.S. dropped by 126. And by comparison, in 1990, there were 455,000 people working in the news business. By early 2017, this had dropped by more than 50%. So that's the bad news. Now, the good news happens to be in this room. There are models that are growing and are thriving. There are online websites, the flashy ones like ProPublica and the Marshall Project, doing top-notch investigative work. They've got Pulitzer Prizes to prove it. Uh, there's been a wave of philanthropic donations that enable uh, radio stations like WNYC, the, the Journalism School, CCEM, to dramatically expand the ability to get some coverage going. There's a model that's being talked about, the nonprofit Texas Tribune, that in combines intensive coverage of the State House in Austin with community based debates and news gathering. It's all shared at no cost with every newsroom in Texas. It's an interesting idea. It's uh, taking shape. It's a little early to announce whether or not we can do something like that in New York, but there have been very serious discussions for over a year now about whether we could try something like that in New York. So I was reading a historian named Heidi Twarek. She wrote in a newsletter in Neiman Lab that we need to take the long view of news, the very long view, which actually spans centuries. So her thesis, which I think is true, and I wanted to share this with you, our view of news coverage may be distorted by the relative golden age that many of us grew up in which lasted from about 1940 to about 1980. For a lot of that time, print media was actually one of the most profitable businesses in the developed world. Newspapers had annual average returns of 12%. Some had profits in the 30% range. Advertisement brought in 80% of newspaper revenue. Readers paid the remaining 20% in subscriptions, which roughly equaled the cost of delivery. And it was basically a license to print money if you had a newspaper. Now, as many of you know, that license, so to speak, has been revoked. Um, there are new money machines out there. There's Google and there's Facebook, and they have shifted the power from the content publishers to the owners of the platforms. They have instantaneous distribution. They have automated sort of crowdsourced curation. It delivers to readers and viewers exactly what they say they want or think they want exactly when they want it. So the old model, while fun, has ended. 
But the reality is that other than that 40-year period, for really most of, of the modern uh, history that we need to think about, people developed and spread news through community outlets. They did it through church sermons, public gatherings, pamphlets that were handed out, books, other small-scale means, which is very much like community and ethnic media, as well as social media and podcasts. So I would suggest to you that we shouldn't get too discouraged by the collapse of the old models, but talk more about how we can kind of go back to what had worked for centuries before, gathering and sharing news on whatever platform we can find or we can build or we can imagine. And then the even better news is that you are the solution that has been waiting in the wings all along. As uh, Randall uh, mentioned, and as I sort of just suggested, I, I come out of community media. Uh, there were a lot of people that I worked with who have gone on to other kinds of platforms, but as you know, once you start in community media, you kind of stay there, uh, at least emotionally. You are the ones, we are the ones, who knew about the immigration crisis and told stories that the rest of the country is only waking up to now. You are the ones who consistently rang the bell on the school's racially segregated, on the city's racially segregated schools and the deepening inequality that is eating at the heart of our communities. The Riverdale Press nailed a rising tide of insider dealing in the Bronx courts with the help of, of Tom Robbins. Brooklyner responded to the national stories about discriminatory treatment of customers at, at Starbucks with a wonderful, wonderful response. They compiled and published a list of dozens of black-owned coffee shops in Brooklyn, right off the bat. No prompting needed, no, no incentives. And I know for a fact that Our Time Press was publishing warnings about predatory lending and the foreclosure crisis long before the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. I know that because they were publishing my column. I was writing about it for them. The, the need for what you do is urgent. It is very much needed. It is very much in demand. And although the week to week and year to year challenges may seem daunting financially, as long as you have what everybody needs, the solutions can be found. I think they will be found sooner than we think. So let me, uh, with that, say congratulations to all of tonight's winners, and thanks for listening. Was that excellent or what? All right, thank you, Mr. Lewis. Thank you so much. Such an inspiring message and much needed at this time. Um, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Errol. And before we proceed to giving out our awards, I would like to invite the co-directors of the Center for Community and Ethnic Media, Karen Pinar and Jahangir Kadik, to tell you a bit more about the center's recent work. Karen, Jahangir. Thanks, Randall, and thanks, Errol, for that, those inspiring words. And thank you so much, Sarah, for your kind words. Sarah was present at the creation of the center and was instrumental in bringing it to the J School, as you heard. She knows the importance of our work and has done so much to champion that work and help us to build on it. For that, Jahangir, Jennifer, and I are very grateful. This is the seventh year that the Ippies, so named because they are awarded to members of the independent press, not the mainstream media, have been sponsored by the Center for Community and Ethnic Media. The Ippies are given for work done during calendar year 2017 and produced by some of the more than 300 media outlets that play a pivotal role in the city's and the region's discourse. Over the past year and a half, since January 2017, a new administration has shown itself to be hostile to immigrants. It has provoked fear across communities and promoted the proliferation of racist remarks and actions 
Against this backdrop, the community and ethnic media have told the stories of their communities and lifted the voices of both victims and resistors. Just a few weeks ago, it was El Diario that broke the story of Pablo Villavicencio Calderon, the pizza delivery man who was seized by ICE as he was making a delivery at a military base in Brooklyn. Although that story went viral in the mainstream media, it originated in ethnic media. And the day after it appeared in El Diario, we translated it into English and published it in Voices of New York. That story, because it was published this year, isn't up for an award. But tonight, you'll hear about other stories that broke new ground or shed light on important issues last year. The reporters we're honoring take the pulse of neighborhoods and communities throughout the city, and they do so with limited resources. Too often, their work is overlooked. So the Yippies are one way we showcase this work. Another way is in Voices of New York, the center's news site, which every weekday translates and posts stories from the ethnic media and publishes excerpts from the English language community press, as well as stories original to Voices. Last year, in addition to carrying numerous stories about the Muslim ban and anti-Trump protests, ICE, detentions, deportations, and the sanctuary movement, we also tracked special local elections and what they meant for different communities. And we published personal accounts of the aftermath of Hurricane Maria that devastated Puerto Rico last September. But the center does lots more to work with and help, with the, help these media outlets. Jahangir? That's right, Karen. We run newsmaker events moderated by our very own Errol Lewis to bring in city officials to meet with the community and ethnic press. Recently, we hosted Corey Johnson, the city council speaker, and Errol moderated a special newsmakers event on the controversy over the inclusion of citizenship question in the 2020 census. The center has held digital trainings funded by the mayor's office of media and entertainment, which have reached 340 attendees since October of 2016, when we kicked off the series. One recent hit among the media we work with, a training on search engine optimization with the digital strategist for the New York Times. Marie Gillot and Luciana Pearson of CUNY J Plus, the professional development arm of the J School help us to design our digital toolkit. This spring, we ran our second health reporting fellowship, and we have also held two business reporting fellowships. And this past year, we worked with the J School's 360 degree video experts, Bob Sasha and Matt McWay, as they designed a collaboration between J School students and community and ethnic media reporters to produce immersive videos and publish them on local news sites. Finally, we continue to help this underfunded media look for ways to improve sustainability. In April, we ran our second advertising conference in two years, and city officials who spoke were mobbed by community and ethnic media publishers after one particularly lively panel. Before continuing, we'd like to thank a few people. Rosaline Ortiz designed our beautiful program. For the second year running, we had the benefit of an easy to use IPI submission tool designed by Fanuel Haverias. Jennifer Chang, our associate editor, does an extraordinary job assisting in producing Voices of New York and planning the IPIs. Kathy Harding and Gogi Padilla set us on the right course for this event. We received support and expertise from Alistair Wallace and Pam Drayton. Thanks too to Ramel Butcher, Frandy Germain, Pauline Floyd, and Nicholas Pacheco. And a special shout out to Steve Haynes. Now back to you, Randall. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Jehangir. Okay. Drum roll. Now, the moment we've all been waiting for has arrived. It is time to award the Ippies for best work produced in 2017 by community and ethnic press in New York City. This year, we are awarding 
prizes in nine categories. There will be no prize given in the best print publication design category this year because there were too few entries. Helping me to announce the winners will be the great investigative journalist and professor Tom Robbins, who teaches investigative reporting at the CUNY J School. And he was a lead judge for the IPI's investigative category. Submission in each IPI's category was reviewed by two or three judges drawn from the CUNY Journalism School faculty, as well as professional journalists. You can see the list of the judges on the back of your programs. The judging panels worked independently of each other, and the winners are known only to a few people, a handful of people in this room. Um, and before we reveal who the winners are, let's first see who the judges were. Judges, would you please stand and accept our thanks for your hard work in selecting the finalists. <laughs> judges, stand please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, a few brief instructions. Why don't you just hate that instructions? We're reporters, we don't follow instructions. What are you talking about? Uh, but anyway, when you, hear your <laughs> when you hear your names, please come to the podium to receive your awards. Now, in order to keep the program moving swiftly and smoothly, we ask that you refrain from taking photographs during the presentation. So if you have your friends, your significant other in the seat with the camera, stay in the seat for now. Uh, as you can see, we have an official photographer, actually two um, photographer here. After the awards, official photographs will be taken uh, to my left in uh, the research center uh, off to your right. And you're all at that point in time and place welcome to take your own photographs in the research center. Okay? Okay? Okay, fine. Yes, reporters always say yes until they say no. Um, <laughs> So without further ado, let us begin. The first category is Best Online Publication Design. The site is clearly laid out with a home page that is easy to navigate and understand on desktop. Overall, the site makes good use of visuals with easy to see, well-cropped images and continues to effectively promote its social presence on the main site. That's what the judges said about third place winner, Forum Daily, the Russian language publication. Victoria Butenko of Forum Daily, please come up. The site has, uh, so this is not Victoria, but that's okay. <laughs> the site has continued to step up its game, the judges said, with a distinctive new logo, a home page with a modern newsfeed style layout, especially clean on desktop, and pleasing typography, judicious use of color, and easy to understand intuitive navigation. And that will go now to the second place winner, Prim Krishnamurti for Brooklyner just mentioned earlier by Errol Lewis. Please. <laughs> Congratulations. Prem Krishnamurti. And, okay. And now, a first time entrant in the Ippies contest wins first place. The entry, the bridge. A Brooklyn business publication wins the prize for best overall design of an online publication. The judges said it's attractive, easy to read site that clearly gives thought to typography, color, and photography. Joe Egan and Aaron Guthan, are you here? Joe Egan and Aaron Guthan, please come to get your prize for best design of an online publication for The Bridge. Congratulations. Our second category of the evening is Best Photograph. This superbly executed image for a story about Vision Zero uses color and light to transform an inanimate object into a powerful symbol of a story that sadly has, seen, has been a story in New York for much too long. Third place for this beautiful image goes to Adi Talwar for his photo in City Limits. Mr. Talwar, please come forward. Congratulations. Congratulations. The judges said that this image 
wonderfully captures an important moment for the Asian American community of New York State and Chinatown in particular. Chun Chao Hong of World Journal wins second place for his photograph of Yulin Niao and her mother in the New York State Assembly Chamber. Congratulations. This intimate image illustrates one family's experience of a story that is nothing less than a national crisis. Do we have that image up? Um, and the judges said they were moved by it. For her photo, Immigration Broken Family in El Diario, Mariella Lombard wins the prize for best photography. Congratulations. Now, if you're following along in your program, you'll see we've reached the third category, best video. Identity and inclusion, the judges noted, play a major role in the world today. This sweet story highlights the importance of being seen, utilizing not only well-shot video, but creative graphics. Third place goes to Yo Yu, Jing Gong, and Ti Rong Fan, of Sinovision for their video, Dad's Special Gift for Daughter Whose Identity Crisis Reminded Him Who He Really Was. <laughs> okay, come forward, please. Congratulations. Okay, thank you. The judges called this an artistic, well shot and produced and compelling personal story for shedding much needed light on issues of the justice system and defendants diagnosed with mental illness and exploring alternatives to prison sentencing. Producers Martin Granby and Megan Donis of Brick TV win second place for or fight for mercy. Hashtag be heard. Congratulations. Our next video demonstrated creative and informative filmography with a clever and sometimes witty voice, said the judges, for brilliantly telling the story of a small and often overlooked bureaucratic committee and the community it serves. Qin Ying Wong and Ji Jing Xu of Sinovision take first place for Chinatown residents mail their letters into a $7,000 intelligent trash bin. Come, please. Congratulations. Now, I would like to invite Tom Robbins to come to the podium to continue with the awards presentation. Mr. Robbins. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm multimedia, pardon me. Woof. This happened in another, uh, uh, <laughs> but at least I didn't give the wrong winner. Uh, <laughs> the judges said that this podcast offers a powerful mix of music, storytelling, and journalism. Right away, we learned that someone can be falsely imprisoned for 20 years and in most states receive nothing in compensation. Hip hop music drives the story of Alan Newton who ended up exonerated and broke in New York. We learned that Newton would have received a large check in a few states such as Alabama, illustrating the vast disparity of compensation. For their story, exonerated and broke in Newsbeat, Michael Conforti, Jeff Main, Rashid Mian, Jed Moray, and Christopher Tarowski win third place. Congratulations. Okay, uh, directed at the Chinese community, a 10-part documentary is full of historical revelations about Flushing, Queens. Anchored by Paul Chu, a Queens librarian, 
the highly polished programs connect these new Americans to 400 years of previous Flushing residents who built a community and a democracy, including a model for freedom of religion. The judges awarded second place to Shui Wang, Tian Tian, Xiao Liu, Li Chen Zong, Tiao Si Shen of Sinovision for their report, Flushing History. Please come forward. Congratulations. Look at the camera. <laughs> Our next series uses video, audio, and print to tell the story of the tension between revitalization and displacement in Bronx communities along Jerome Avenue. Jacob Shore, Andrew Sager, Julia Reist, Diana Nelson, and David Cruz of Norwood News, WFUV, and BronxNet collaborated on The Bronx Develops, which wins the prize for best multimedia package. Wait, 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 don't, don't, don't leave. Look, look at the camera, look at the camera. Oh, wait, 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 turn around. The camera, the camera. <laughs> For TV people, come on. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, I think now is the time. <laughs> Tom Robbins. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. It's so great to do this. This is my favorite event of all. I originally went to a old timers meeting of uh, reporters and editors who got together. It was not nearly as fun or as exciting as this one is every year. But I, I'm very thankful for the fact that they let this old hippie give out the ippies. You know, it is really an honor to do it. But there was a couple of things that were on my mind that I'll be real quick about them since Errol and Sarah and, and Karen were much more eloquent than I could be on these subjects. But I, last year I, I talked about how there was this gale force wind headed in our direction from Washington and that we were, those of us who were in the business of local journalism, we're going to have to be the first ranks of defenders to try to sort of fight that off and keep track of it. And it's interesting because it didn't actually break the way that I thought it would. You know, the, the, the Trump budgets, if you looked at what he called for, the absolutely draconian, astonishing cuts that he demanded, you know, they were enough to completely eviscerate the municipal budget and all the social services that this city relies on, those didn't happen. You know, we're actually doing pretty well in terms of the federal budget. Instead, we got this other nonstop diet, which, you know, this week reached such a, such a frenzy, the, the sights and sounds of children inside cages. I mean, something that, a phrase that you wouldn't think that you actually have to say, but it's, that's the pictures we were looking at and those are the audios we were hearing. And an administration, until it was basically shamed into backing off, was fully committed to it. I watched on Errol's channel, New York One, a guy who's running for Congress in Staten Island, who's ahead in the polls, say that, look, it's no different than dropping your child off at the nursery. The children start crying. And then he went on to say that these kids are probably being better cared for than they ever have in their life. The, the depths of what the Trump ethos has been, has been like continually debilitating, continually you know, depressing. Uh, I think you know, everybody's tried to sort of keep their spirits up in the face of all this, but it certainly is, it certainly is hard on a day-to-day on a -day basis, which is you know, one of the reasons I get a kick out of out of reading the, the stories that come in for these prizes. I see people plugging away week after week, day after day, doing great work in the trenches. I want to say one other thing that I just, in the last week that I see breaking in New York that worries me a little bit as, as I, 
as I watch this debate about specialized schools. And I know it's going to be a wrenching one. I know it's, it's a tough one. It is already. But this old hippie remembers only too well the 1968 school strike, which you can look up. Now, I can tell you is that it ripped this city apart 50 years ago, and it created fissures that were never healed. It was Jews, it was blacks, it was communities on one side. People really did not talk to each other. They were in the streets and they were at their throats. The one thing that you guys can do, and you're going to cover this passionately, you're going to cover it with as much accuracy, as much detail as you do. I got this idea from talking to Karen Penar about it, who thinks about these things a lot. Talk to each other. Let the Amsterdam News talk to the World Journal. You know, let, let everybody combine on their coverage and try to think about, see about how the other side is seeing this. You know, bring stories from one publication into the other. Let's just try to avoid the potential ugliness of the fight that I worry that we might face if not, you know, we, that what we're really looking for is just the best for all the kids of New York to be able to share in those great schools. Errol's been very eloquent on the subject and has been bringing a lot of people onto New York One to talk about it. I hope there's going to be a lot of more voices, but I would just give that proviso as an old hand looking out at how this story is playing out. All right, enough of that. Let's get to the good stuff. The first category I'm going to read out is editorial and commentary. This passionately written piece, the judges found, marshals key statistics from a variety of sources to make a solid and important argument. For the commentary, keeping immigrants out isn't the key to our safety. Gun control is. Melanie Mata of YC Teen wins third place. Congratulations. The judges said that this solidly written piece offered a clear, specific idea for improving a community and examples of why it might work effectively. For a simple plan, put government to work in East New York, Tucker Reed in the bridge garners second place. Tucker. Congratulations. A top award goes to a piece that had demonstrable impact on the community and pedestrian safety. The author, the judges said, didn't just opine, she reported, spent time observing and photographing parents and children trying to navigate a dangerous crossing near a newly opened school, carefully documenting the risks and traffic woes. The result, a new stoplight and crosswalk. For danger and chaos as a new school opens in Brooklyn, Leanna Zagari, a Brooklyner, wins the prize for best editorial and commentary. <laughs> Next up, we have the best small circulation publication category. This three-year-old publication is making a splash with daily coverage of everything political and governmental in Brooklyn. From news conferences to protests to features about Brooklyn, this is the place to go if you want to see what your elected representatives are up to. Its mission, to cover government at its source, to foster more voter involvement and strengthen democracy in Brooklyn. The judges applauded the efforts of Kings County Politics, which wins third place in the best small circulation category. to say how good people are being about the photo rule. It's quite, it's quite astonishing. Usually they're popping up. I told Sarah, this is like the Bill Murray routine. It's usually like a whack-a-mole thing where people jump up to take the pictures. <laughs> With a solid range of stories and reader services, this publication continues to impress. The June 2017 issue led with concerns about the future of the Red Hook Container Terminal, which employs 1,500 people, 
but whose lease with the Port Authority expires next year. Other stories covered a dispute over a new liquor license, the sale of waterfront industrial properties to a private equity firm, and efforts to get a traffic light installed at a dangerous intersection. The Red Hook Star Review wins second place. The judges said they were particularly impressed with the excellent balance of stories in the February 16th, March 1st, 2017 edition of this publication. The cover story was about parental reaction to the closing of the St. Anne School three years after its sister school, sister church was shuttered and included a conflict of interest piece and how the attorney for a developer behind a controversial proposal doubles as the lawyer of the Bronx political machine that will decide the project's fate. It's exactly the kind of stories that Errol Lewis was talking about a few minutes ago that go unnoticed and uncovered in papers like the News and the Post, which usually would have been on something like this. Other issues offered standout reporting done in collaboration with Fordham University's WFUV, exploring illiteracy in the South Bronx. Norwood News takes the best prize for small, takes the first prize for best small circulation publication. <laughs> the best social issues story category received 37 entries this year, making especially stiff competition. This story explores how some artists are working to make disability a larger part of the conversation about diversity in the push for greater inclusion, especially in city-funded cultural projects. David Brand wins third place for his article, New York City's Cultural Plan Spurs Disabled Artists, City Limits. This story went behind the headlines to provide context and paint nuanced portraits of some of the 14,000 Long Islanders who arrived in the U.S. as children and whose lives remain in limbo amid a fierce debate over the fate of the Obama-era Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Maria Piedrabuena of Riverhead Local wins second place for her article, Local Dreamers Worry About Their Uncertain Future After DACA Program Ends. This writer hit the streets to examine the impact of Trump-era immigration crackdowns on vendors, the judges said, and succeeded in putting a human face on an undercovered story. The stakes for immigrants trying to eke out a living were clear in the economic toll of increased immigration enforcement. New York City vendors suffer losses. Catherine Hernandez takes the, best pri takes the prize for the best social issues story for her piece in Feet in Two Worlds. The competition was also stiff in the best story about a community category, which pulled in 29 entries. This revealing report on diversity and divisions in Manhattan's Chinatown expertly explains the arguments over who represents the community and should have a voice in its future as gentrification threatens the very character of this historic district. For the battle for Chinatown in Tsingdao Daily, Rong Xiaoqing wins third place. Wow. the Chinatown story. This colorful portrait of the first Chinatown on the East Coast brings to light the little known story of the Chinese community in Belleville, New Jersey, and how it paved the way for the Chinatown in Manhattan and other cities. For her story of the first Chinatown on the East Coast in Open City, April Shu wins second place.
The judges said this was an exhaustively reported examination of development on Staten Island. In-depth coverage helps readers understand the actions and attitudes that have fueled the debate over real estate and rezoning on New York's most undercovered borough. For 13 years after blocking new development, Staten Island hopes to welcome just enough of it in city limits. Abigail Savage Lou wins the prize for best story about a community. And now we come to that final category of best investigative in-depth story. And there were fewer than usual selections that we had to consider on this, but I, I gotta say that we had a really hard time, myself and the other three judges, deciding like what order, and we shuffled them around a few times before we ended up, and any one of these probably could have ended up with the top prize. But I'll start with one that had incredible impact in its local community. This publication was tipped by a loyal, by a loyal reader that an enormous oil spill was seeping into Gravesend Bay and the reporter rushed to the Brooklyn waterfront last April to check it out. Initially stonewalled by both federal environmental officials and representatives of Bayside Fuel Depot where the spill occurred, she was able to get confirmation after obtaining both photos and video from other local residents. The reporter and her editor chased down the story detailing its impact on the environment and probably most forcefully compelling local politicians to respond. It was exactly the kind of story that too often goes untold as major media pull back from neighborhood coverage in a textbook example of how to combine old fashioned on the street reporting and crowdsourcing from readers. Third place goes to Carly Miller and Leanna Zagari of Brooklyner. Some of the stories were really tough to read, including this one. So in November, a 38-year-old masseuse named Soon Yang tragically leaped to her death from a fourth floor balcony in Flushing, Queens, amid a police raid aimed at arresting prostitutes. After the death, reporter Peter Chu interviewed friends and colleagues of the victim, piecing together the troubled trail of how Soon arrived in the US, her shame at past arrests, harassment by local youths, and most disturbingly, her fears of police retaliation after she had reported to the local precinct that an NYPD officer flashing his badge and gun had attempted to rape her several months before her fatal fall. For his story, rather die than get arrested, second place goes to Peter Chu of the World Journal. This story was one, when we read it, it sounded familiar. And usually, that's like a suspicious sign sometimes that, well, wait a minute, I read this someplace before. In this case, there was a reason for that, I'll tell you why. This well-reported story used both police and community sources to tell the details of how a convincing group of scam artists preyed on women in Chinese communities using fear, superstition, and a well-practiced con to steal hundreds of thousands of dollars from their victims, several of whom lost their life savings. The reporter described how the elaborate stories concocted by the schemers play on age-old cultural beliefs and the emotional trauma that follows once victims realize they've been fleeced. The story not only alerted readers to beware of the grifters who are working their con in Asian communities across the country, and here's where the familiar part kicks in. It also seems to have caught the eye of the mainstream press because indeed we had read it before in the New York Magazine, New Yorker Magazine, but we went back and we looked to see when the New Yorker piece ran and when April's story ran, we realized that hers was months earlier. For her story, The Blessing Scam, a con returns to haunt Chinese community in Singdao Daily, April Shu wins the prize for best investigative in-depth story.
congratulations. We have one more award, the prestigious Voices of New York Award, and I'm going to invite Karen. Oh, I don't have to invite you back on the stage. You're already here to make the presentation. Karen? Thanks, Tom. Um, I know everyone's eager to get dessert and celebrate uh, your winning, uh, winnings, so I'll be brief. Um, this is the fourth year we're giving the Voices of New York Award, designed to single out a member of the community Think press who we believe has done extraordinary work. We decided to do something a little different this year. As you know, the essential work of Voices of New York is to bring stories from the community and ethnic press to readers, stories they might otherwise not have the opportunity to read. Earlier this evening, I cited one of those stories, the report about the ICE seizure and detention of an Ecuadorian man delivering pizza at a military base in Brooklyn. The reason you can read stories like those in English is because of translators. Translators are quite simply essential to what we do. We work with translators who not only scan numerous publications for us with an eye toward pitching important and timely stories, but who also must turn those stories around quickly and bring an understanding of a wide range of issues to their translations. Good translation is both a skill and an art. Um, now, I'm actually not sure that the uh, recipients of this award are still here, but I, I will proceed. For the four years that I have been editing Voices of New York, I've come to rely heavily on the judgment of our translators. Although I question them, and sometimes we negotiate just the right turn of phrase, their judgment is paramount. Day in and day out, whether they were here in New York or working remotely in San Juan, Barcelona, Athens, or Berlin, the two I have relied on most heavily, whose work has been reliably excellent, timely, and graceful, are Karina Cassiano and Carlos Rodriguez Martorell. Karina and Carlos are a team in real life, as well as in their work for Voices of New York. Karina does more of the direct translations, Carlos more of the summarizing, pitching, and editing, though he translates as well. They've worked out a very effective division of labor and make their work seem effortless, although I know it isn't. I think it's fair to say that neither of them really set out in life to be translators. Karina is an actress and playwright, while Carlos is a writer and editor. They're both very talented and both charming to work with. For their great contribution to Voices of New York over the years, we're giving two Voices of New York awards this year to Karina and Carlos. And if you are in the room, please come and accept your awards. But I think they're not. So, um, Randall, do you want to give us the last word? Sure. And uh, congratulations, Carlos and Karina, wherever you are. When that, uh, as they used to say in that uh, comedy, what well, not comedy, cartoon we watched, uh, da, 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 that's all, folks. Congratulations to all the winners. Uh, you can gather for photos in the Research Center, and everyone, please uh, join us for dessert and coffee in the reception area. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your dedication. Thank you for truth. <laughs>